Hello everybody and I'm delighted to welcome you to the latest Royal Academy of Engineering Cafe which is Connecting Awardees Fostering Engagement series. Um, my name's Professor Karen Holford, I'm Chair of the Royal Academy of Engineering Research Committee. I'm currently Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Cardiff University which you can see the beautiful buildings in the background and I'm soon to become Chief Executive and Vice-Chancellor of Cranfield University from August the 1st. I am your Chair for this evening's session. So today we'll be discussing really exciting topic, university spin-outs, and we'll begin with a brief introduction from our panel, followed by a panel discussion, and then an opportunity for you all to pose questions. Please note that this event session is being recorded and may be published on the Royal Academy of Engineering's website. Throughout the event, please do submit your questions by simply clicking on the chat feature and typing located at the bottom of your scheme and typing your question into the open field. And I really will try and get to as many questions as possible, but apologies in advance if, if I have to miss out your question for time. Alternatively, we're going to try and enable anybody who wishes to verbally ask their question to do so. So if you would like to do this, um, you can use the reactions button located again at the bottom of your screen and select raise hands. And again, I'll try and look and um, invite you to raise a question again, time permitting. So spin outs are a really key vehicle for getting the incredible ideas and innovations developed in all of our universities into real world products and processes. Um, at the start of the year, the Academy published its Spotlight on Spinouts report, which I would urge you to read if you haven't had time to do yet. Really fascinating data, and it provides a baseline understanding of UK spinouts how many, how much, who, and where, which provides food for thought as to where we go from here. Today, we're going to hear from individuals who've spun out from universities both in the UK and in Thailand. So I'm delighted to introduce you to today's brilliant panel. Um, Dr. Andrew McPherson, who is one of our Royal Academy of Engineering Senior Research Fellows with a Fellowship in Embedded Music Computing at Queen Mary University of London and in conjunction with Bella. Dr. Susanna Clark, a member of the Royal Academy of Engineering Enterprise Hub from Imperial College London and co-founder of Embody Orthopaedic. And Dr. Waran Yu Pulcharian, um, Chulongkan University in Thailand, CEO and co-founder of BioPhytoPharm. So welcome to the three of you and I hope that you'll really enjoy this session. It's, it's fairly informal so feel free to speak at ease and I'd like to start by asking each of our panel to give a brief introduction. So Andrew could you tell, start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah absolutely well th thank you so much for the introduction Karen and I'm really delighted to be here with my fellow panelists. Um, yeah, so my name is Andrew. Uh, I am by training an electronic engineer and a composer, and my specific area of interest is in creating digital musical instruments and maybe more broadly creating technologies for the creative arts and studying how musical performers interact with their instruments. So at Queen Mary, I lead a research lab called the Augmented Instruments Laboratory. This is part of Queen Mary's Center for Digital Music, and it's a team of about 12 people, and um, we've had a number of research projects over the years that have gone on to wider use outside of just the people in the lab, and two of those have gone on to be spin-out companies. One of them is called Bella. Uh, Bella is basically a sort of friendly but powerful embedded computer board, which can be used to make musical instruments and other kinds of audio or artistic projects. And Bella is specifically, uh, after spinning out in 2016, became one of three industrial sponsors on my Royal Academy of Engineering uh, Fellowship. That's great. Thank you very much, Andrew. We're delighted to welcome you tonight. And uh, next, Susanna, please, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, hi, yeah, thanks, Karen, and um, thank you very much for inviting me to the cafe. Um, my name is Susanna Clark. Um, I co-founded a company called Embody uh, in 2012. It's a spin out from Imperial College London. I, I co-found, I'm an engineer, um, a sort of mechanical engineer by training, but I did my PhD in, in medical engineering in the orthopedic field and co-founded a company with an orthopedic consultant surgeon um, called Professor Justin Cobb. And um, we spun out the company designing uh, 3D printed customized instrumentation for um, both standard and sort of quite um, complicated procedures. Um, but since then we've, we've sort of sidestepped and we've now developed a, a new implant, which is um, three years into first in human trials um, and hopefully will be um, available soon. 
Thanks, Susanna. Yeah, that's great. And, and finally, uh, Warren Yu, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, my name is Warren Yu Punjalun, or you can call me Bang. Um, I, I was trained in plant biology, and uh, my research area is uh, development of plant produce recombinant protein. Then uh, we try to use the, the whole plant as a platform to produce the different type of recombinant protein and apply it as, as a um, drug or the vaccine. Then uh, I have experience in producing uh, producing um, Ebola vaccine in plant, you know, rabies, monoclonal antibodies. And um, I uh, start working in university in Thailand as a uh, lecturer and also researcher in university in Thailand for 10 years. Uh, but I just been out uh, the company for almost three years. Uh, I and my co-founder, both of us are the uh, professor in university in Thailand. And uh, we develop like the different type of recombinant protein for cosmetic, for um, animal or human uh, drug. But just last year, that when there is the COVID, then we just uh, start developing COVID vaccine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Pang. And there couldn't be a more relevant um, time to, you know, be developing vaccines, could there? So, um, yeah, that's really great. So I think probably to just start this discussion, um, I haven't seen any questions come in yet. So um, I've got perhaps whenever I talk to people who've, um, and there are people on this call, actually, I can see who I've talked to in the past about spin out. So maybe we'll bring them in in the future. But I think to each of you, Andrew first and then Susanna and then Pang, the obvious question that I always ask people is, why did you do it? What inspired you to spin out? Right, I guess I'll, I'll answer that first. Um, it wasn't actually a, a commercial reason at first. I think actually setting up a company uh, was a sort of secondary objective. I, I had these projects in my lab, uh, musical instruments or these uh, tools for creating instruments. And we really had the sense that uh, there were a lot of people who might want to use these more than just the people that we could reach directly as, as the research team. But ultimately, especially when you're working with hardware, you can't just put it on a website and say, go download it for yourself you need some kind of production apparatus to actually get these things out there to people. So before there was a company, uh, for me, there was a Kickstarter campaign. So I don't know if people here are familiar with Kickstarter, but it's basically a, a crowdfunding platform where you can say, here's my project, here's the amount of money I'd like to raise. Um, if I reach this goal within you know, 30 days, then, then it's funded and we will deliver to you whatever things that we say we're gonna make. So um, I started out basically running Kickstarter campaigns for several projects in my lab, one in 2013 and another then in 2016, and didn't necessarily have ambitions to do a spin-out company at the time, but basically it turned out that the level of interest was really high. And the question really came to, okay, how are we going to sustain this? How are we going to grow it? How are we going to make a bigger community? So um, I guess for me, ultimately, it, it's, it's about reaching people, at least as much as it's about any particular economic impacts, but they have to go hand in hand because you have to be able to sustain your efforts. Yeah, sure. And I think it's probably quite a big decision for an academic to enter into a spin, isn't it? Because it's not something that we are naturally kind of, you know, sort of motivated to do, I guess. We're normally not motivated by money at all. We're normally motivated by discovery, aren't we? So so I can see, you know, I can see that. And that's, that's really interesting. And Susanna, how about you? What, what was your inspiration? Um, quite, quite different, um, really. Um, my my intention was was always to start a company and I, and I sort of came, I, I was there before I even came into the academic sphere. Um, after after I um, trained as an engineer, I, I did a course, um, a combined course between the Royal College of Art and Imperial College, which um, pops up at the Academy uh, and the Royal Academy um, of Engineers quite a lot, um, which is um, a course which is just all about um, sort of starting up um, your own thing. Um, and so I always intended to, but I, I always held back because I, I felt like I, I really need to understand thoroughly, you know, like the, there needs to be a real problem and I really need to be solving it. And I, um, that's why I ended up doing a PhD because that was sort of my way of, of understanding how to really solve a problem and to be so certain in it that it was worthwhile spinning it out. So I actually, I always intended that to be the end game, but um, I wanted to go via the the academic route to, to truly understand and solve something. 
that's interesting and I can understand that need to you know understand the problem that you're trying to solve first before you actually go to the spin out did you ever find you know building on that did you ever find at any point in the three years that you attempted to just forget the PhD and do the spin out um no no not really I mean because when you start you know like it's almost like like just stopping doing the PhD is, is really difficult you know like you, yeah. just, you know that actually that in itself is, is you know the sort of searching and finding out is um you know it went when to draw the line was actually the, the difficult thing I suppose because you know you, um I, I always just work by the sort of like you know 80 20 rule that you're never going to get all the way there but if you're kind of 80 percent sure that you've sort of got there then that's the time to like to move on because yeah it's gone forever otherwise you, oh yeah tell me about it you can go on forever with PhD if you don't watch it can't you yeah. right okay yeah and Pang what about you what inspired you for your spin out Actually, I did not uh, aim for a spin out or for any company before, you know, like uh, I enjoy teaching and doing research. Um, I, I got uh, the government scholarship from my country to do PhD in US. And after I, I get I finished PhD and I came back and working in university teaching. Uh, but, you know, like in Thailand, we have the we have quite limited limited funding for research. Okay, we, we didn't have much money for research from the government and uh, we had to use lots of money to train students and I teach in faculty of pharmaceutical science. Like after uh, five, six years, I realized that, you know, like we, we, we use lots of effort to train students uh, to do research in drug discovery and development, you know, and uh, finally at the end, they just like most, almost like none of them working in research. Like, you know, but I just think like, why, you know, but actually it's because there is no career path for, for them, for Thai students uh, to do research. You know, there is no, uh, in Thailand, we cannot develop any drug or vaccine by ourselves. You know, we just import all. That's the thing that I have like, okay, then why I have to teach them, right? To, and we, we use also money, train them to do something else that they don't use it at all. Then I just have like, what can I do to, uh, and you know, like I want to have, actually when I start doing research in university, I try to uh, bring my research to other people and try to, to have like technology transfer, you know, without charging anything. I want them to do it, you know, because I don't want to do like company, it's not my type. But in Thailand, no one, uh, no one believe. I have to say that I, I heard like I lost up the word like it's impossible. It's impossible. Only uh, publication something like that. Then for me, I feel like I feel like I just need to prove. You know, if I don't do it, like no one gonna do it because this is the technology that I'm working on. And uh, another thing is like for faculty, uh, for for professor in university in Thailand. You know, uh, I think just get the government funding, uh, doing research and do and get some publication. Uh, we have to pay a lot to publish in good journal, you know, and for developing country like us, I feel like it's just useless. And, you know, like if we do research, we have to have like, try to commercialize, you know, if, we, if I am in UK or in US, you know, maybe there's the bridging people, you know, I can be in the lab and there's someone to have like, link between the research and commercialization but in thailand i think we need to start to do that and i feel like uh i, I want to have uh, right now we have like the company that i can get the students uh, from my lab from the university to work in the company and and actually i still be in the same role and i still teach them but they will train be trained by like learning by doing which I, I can see uh, the development of the education in the country. Mm -hmm. That's kind of why yeah. I moved from the <laughs> education to uh, spin out, yeah. Yeah, and that's really interesting as well because you know education of, of people in your country being the motivation is, is a fantastic motivation, but also you've got the added motivation of having being able to develop vaccines in your own country rather than reliance on other countries. So I can see see that's really motivating. So I think we've got three 
you know, entrepreneurs here with, with very different motivations for creating spin outs, but all of them are really interesting. And I, I expect there's spin out people out there in the audience who, you know, got even different motivations. So it's, that's really interesting. Thank you. Now I can see a couple of questions in the chat. So I will go to those now, actually. Um, and um, I'll go to the second one first, which is from David Barrow, who I know is uh, has experience of spin outs himself from Cardiff University, successful spin outs. And David wants to know from each of you, um, and, and this is really relevant actually for people going into spin out. So what, what were your experiences with um, your university's involvement in your spin out? And in what stage did you feel the need to cut the apron strings from the university if you have done? And then, um, you know, as a follow on for that, how important was and is IP and, you know, the own IP or, or the university's um, IP ownership. So I'll go around again in the same order. So, uh, so Andrew, have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um... I've had really great support and experiences from uh, from Queen Mary on spin out. So um, Queen Mary Innovation is basically an organization within the, in, within the university, which is set up specifically to support entrepreneurship and commercialization. And um, they've been really supportive with, you know, small pots of proof of concept funding with advice on contracts and on IP. And I, I would say that um, one thing that is nice uh, it, about the way that they operate. And I guess this is probably true of a lot of universities is that it's a relatively light touch. You don't really feel like you desperately need to cut the apron strings because they're, you're not so tightly tied down to begin with. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I think that, you know, so for me anyway, I, I mean, I do still have a fairly strong link to the university, partly because, you know, I'm still an academic there, you know, that is still my, my offices that, you know, that's, uh, I haven't, you know, I haven't felt the need to, you know, kind of completely sever ties and go set up premises somewhere else. Um, I think it probably is really dependent on the specific project, really. And I think for me, it's also really tied up in the fact that um, I'm interested in having this company, um, Bella, basically get off the ground organically uh, rather than being driven by external investment and you know that is just a, a judgment about my particular situation and the kind of freedom to operate that i'm looking for um, it does tie to the second part of that question about ip in company development um, i i do have i mean uh, personally i find that in in some of these sectors especially if you're in electronic hardware or you're in the musical instrument space or something I'm not convinced that, uh, you know, that having a, a really kind of formal patent portfolio ultimately helps you all that much. It seems to me that uh, in, in that kind of market, the best thing is just to, to operate quickly, just, you know, do something, always stay ahead of the competition, um, always have a really exciting reason that people want to come to you, have a lot of credibility around your brand, maybe, but um, all of the products that, that we make in for Bella are open source hardware, open source software. You could go to our GitHub and download all of the designs and make them for yourself and never pay us anything. And but that's really important because there's a certain kind of community engagement and uh, I guess a kind of credibility that comes with that, which again is perhaps very sector specific. But I think one piece of advice I would give people um, is just to really carefully scrutinize the kind of norms in the sector that you're in and not necessarily assume that there is one formula that you have to apply you know first you file for these patents and then you and then you go and you get this particular kind of investment and you go through these various rounds of funding and then you do this and then you do that perfectly great for some things but uh, you know for other situations um, you know I think it's uh, yeah you maybe forge a path that works for you. Yeah, very good advice Andrew and so in a different sector the orthopedic sector Susanna how is that for you? Um, yeah, we've um, we've always had a um, so it's Imperial Innovations or it was actually uh, the the body has has changed um, sort of um, ownership over the time that we've been involved with them. But yeah, um, a bit like you say, Andrew, we we've had um, like a, quite a light touch sort of relationship with them, which means that you know kind of like um, it's uh, it's it's fine. But you you know when you're in a field that you know about, you always know about it a lot more than you know any no one could know as much about it as you I suppose so we've never really been able to um get any really strong advice I suppose from the technology transfer office but we have had um support from them and um we are actually just about to to, to leave um uh the the university because we we kind of use it for office space I suppose and facilities at the moment we've done that for many years and that has actually been great because you know we can grow and we can we sort of subcontract a lot of people from the lab to to do um sort of bits of work for us and 
Um, we've always um, had this uh, um, sort of idea for a kind of circulating relationship with the lab that we spun out of, which is that, you know, the IP came into the company, we spun it out, we do commercial things, but then we, we feed back in, you know, like what the current needs are and we feed in for new projects and we have this nice relationship. And the only reason we're, we're really moving out now is just, you know, we need um, store, you know, storeroom space, and we just, we just, we just can't sort of do that with any university environment. But there's, there's no negative for us staying, and the, I don't think cutting the apron strings would be required for us to to move forward. It's literally, it's just logistics, actually. Yeah, thank you, Susanna. And Pang, are things different in Thailand with your university in terms of, um, you know, support for for your spin out? Yeah. Actually, we get a support uh, a lot from university. Uh, we were incubated with the CU Innovation Hub, where which formed by the alumni of the university. You know, we, we get mentor in terms of like business model from university, uh, but it's not nothing about the funding. You know, because uh, with with our company, uh, we started with our own uh, money of the co-founders. Uh, we use the space of university and we have to pay for the rent you know um right now we are building the uh, gmp facility for uh produ for manufacturing the the vaccine covid vaccine for clinical trial phase one and the facility is in university as well um then in in terms of the support we, we get this kind of like in Thai thing and you know like the, the training the uh about the ip actually we have uh, our own IP as uh, for you know uh, for for company okay but I agree with Andrew that for from for us you know like uh, the speed is very important and uh, you know like in drug uh, business you know uh, we are not the big company that uh, we can you know like I think we have like uh, positioning ourselves as a R&D company then you know the, and there are so many like uh, drug or vaccine in, in our country or even in our area that the big company is not interested in at all. Then we, we still finding like the niche market like that. That's, and, and, you know, like in Thailand, uh, even like not only all, uh, other platform, you know, not, not only plant platform, but even like uh, normal standard uh, platform, like show sales or something we have, we don't have any drug company producing any drug or vaccine in the country. Even in the Southeast Asia, still not, not many, okay? Then uh, for, for us, uh, the, the, we give the chair to the university. Then the university don't want any IP from us. Then we can have the IP for the company if we have that kind of model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's really, that's really interesting. And I think my own views on IP is that, you know, sometimes I think that as Andrew said at the beginning, tying up the IP is, is just not the, is not the route to success, is it? Because you really want to create your reputation. Really, you want to work with other companies you want to build and you want to maintain relationships. And once you get into legal wrangles of IP, you know, it kind of spoils the the, the sort of innovation in what you're doing, doesn't it? Um, so there, there, there's a lot of debate about this at the moment. Um, so it isn't a debate that'll go on and on, I'm sure. Um, so I, I just think that one of the things that, um, people talk to me when they're talking about spin outs is that they're, they're worried about that there'll be too many obstacles. So perhaps um, I could go around again and just ask you each, which was the biggest obstacle you faced in your journey so far and how you overcame that. All right, um, happy happy to start again. I mean, there's, I mean, I, I, there's a lot of sort of little obstacles at the time that seem like really big obstacles. And then you look back and you think, oh, that was just a thing you just had to plow through. I guess for me, the sort of structural obstacle that, that comes up a lot in kind of research into industry is that there is this something of a chasm that has to be leaped where uh, essentially, you have you can get your project to a certain point where you can do pub, you can publish things about it and you can extend it further and you know there comes a point at which it's really no longer kind of novel research there's not many more papers to be gotten out of it and then you know ultimately the academic pressures are going to say right leave it put it aside go do something else and you know work on your next high impact publications and yet that point is not necessarily already the point at which somebody is going to want to give you a whole bunch of money either to sort of buy your products or license your technology or even invest in your company. And so 
I think for me, the, the hardest part has been kind of figuring out how to get across this really treacherous domain um, to push maybe the research just a little bit further toward kind of uh, end stage user relevance, and then also to pick up the commercial side just a little bit earlier so that you can connect these things to these things together. And, uh, you know, I've had lots of little specific things that have happened to, to make that happen, but I think it's something that everybody would probably find going from university to uh, company. Yeah, and I guess for anybody who wants to stay as an academic and, and still pursue this, um, you know, the, the spin out work, the important thing is to keep everybody in your department, particularly your line manager, informed of what you're doing and discuss the appropriate time to publish and the appropriate time to, you know, hold back from, from academic publications. Um, you know, it, it's all about, it, I, I, what I'm trying to say is one size doesn't necessarily fit all, mm -hmm. but as long as you talk to people and, and let people know where you're going, because, you know, high impact products and processes and the, the translation of research is just important to, to universities as, as the high impact research papers, um, you know, particularly now when it's so, so it features so big in ref. Yeah, absolutely. And just to add to that, I mean, uh, the, the pressure that I've gotten has never been sort of formal external pressure, anyone coming to me and saying, hey, what are you doing? How are you spending your time? It's much more of a kind of internal pressure of, you know, I, I know that I want to maintain and extend my academic career at the same time as I want to see these projects uh, obtain a commercial life beyond research lab, but there's only so many hours in the day. And so you kind of are aware every hour you put into this is an hour you're not putting into that. And it's just a kind of internal, I don't know, monologue that has to happen all the time. Is this the right use of my time? But you can't let that consume so much time either, then you don't get anything done on either side of the equation. Yeah, exactly. Good advice, Andrew. Susanna, I can see you laughing and we all laugh on what is the best use of our time? That's the perennial question, isn't it? But Susanna, apart from thinking about what's the best use of my time, what are the problems? Did you have any other problems you had to overcome? Um, well, yes, I mean, um, this is this is quite probably quite specific to our field, but I mean, by far in a way, the biggest obstacle has been the regulatory environment in in Europe combined with Brexit. <laughs> so the MDR, which is the new medical devices regulations and Brexit and the withdrawal of one of the major UK notified bodies all happened simultaneously and it, it delayed us just phenomenally. And the unknowns um, about the future regulatory environment, which are brought in by that um, have, have been a total nightmare for, for a small company like us. And what, what has been the most difficult is that we, we raised funding on the back of a, a regulatory milestone that all we could do was, you know, estimate and um, the delays which have been caused by all of these things, you know, um, when you've already taken on your funding, is, you know, it's, it's really difficult to manage. Um, but, you know, I don't know how transferable that is and it's getting better all the time. <laughs> it's just anyone who was caught in, in that really horrible um, mix of things um, like us. Um, yeah, I expect there's a lot of people caught in that. But you're at the stage now where you're doing trials, aren't you? Yes, yeah. How, yeah, long, yeah. how long is that stage for you? Because that must be a bit of a, um, you know, an uncertain stage as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then COVID came, <laughs> which it was very hard for doing trials of um, elective procedures in hospitals because they were frozen mm -hmm. as well. Um, and the, the real uncertainty is how much clinical data you need to collect before you can submit something for a CE mark. So the trial continues, but um, you don't know how much follow up you need to, to take. Um, whereas in other countries that have been running regulation, regulations similar to the um, MDR, like the FDA, they, they have set you know, things to achieve, um, but we haven't got there yet um, in Europe. So <laughs> just a lot of uncertainty. So I think, I mean, always uncertainty probably for, um, so that's, that's transferable, that un uncertainty is a big obstacle to cope yeah. with when you're planning and when you're trying to get funding. I guess, and I suppose you need good mentors around you and, and good support around you in terms of keeping you, keeping you going. Yeah, yeah, and, and in this, like, I mean, we, we've been to so many people and asked so much advice on this, and, and I suppose, and the advice has been no one knows, but that's good advice, because at least the, the one thing to say is that everybody is in the same situation, which does make you feel a lot, a lot better that at least, you know, kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, it's not just happening to you, and we're all going to be slowed down by this. So, you know, in terms of the commercial end, end game, it's the same for everyone. So that takes, us, takes stress out of it. Sure. And Pang, has there been a big obstacle in your journey or is it, it, it sounds pretty, you know, as, it, as if it's been pre pretty trouble free, but I bet it hasn't. So what was the biggest obstacle? 
Okay, yeah, actually there are many obstacles, but the biggest one for me, I think, um, because we are in a pharmaceutical area, then uh, quite same as Susanna, like the regulator is quite the, the big thing with us, you know, like, especially in the country that um, the regulators uh, not get used to uh, all the documents, like let's say we, we always import the, the vaccine, right? The drug, then the regulator get used to the reviewing document from, from abroad. You know, they like for some uh have some document, they don't even have that for the company that developed the drug or the vaccine in the country, you know, and they have to make a new form or some, something mm -hmm. like that, you know. And imagine like we we are in the country that like okay, the, the technology is not that high, but the regulator get used to review with all the documents from the big drug company, like imagine like Pfizer, Moderna, you know, submit all the documents, you know. Then uh, when we develop the vaccine and we use all the guidelines, you know, we use kind of like the, the minimum, minimum uh, that pass the guideline, you know, but all the big company kind of like go to like boom, you know, like let's say only one animal species is enough, but they do like three, you know, then, this kind of thing that we have to have negotiate with the regulator. And, and importantly, the, the our technology is quite new for even for the for them, you know, they they, they never know any uh drug or vaccine from plants. Then we have to have like uh educate the regulator and communicate, negotiate with all the 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 regulatory issue then that is the for me is quite the biggest obstacle but i still think that if we can pass with the first product then uh after this then it should be easier for us yeah yeah thank you okay and i guess um you know the last year has been challenging for everyone so what has it been like for you, for you all through the pandemic? Um, perhaps go back the other way now, Pang, and then Susanna, and then Andrew. You know what? what has been, what's it been like running a company through a pandemic? Yeah, uh, um, for for um, COVID nineteen, you know, like it it get, it's not good for 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 everything. Okay, but anyway, it's the opportunity for our company. Mm. You know, with our, with our, we, we, we build a company because we want to have this platform to be able to, to produce drug and vaccine in this kind of situation. You know, before this, we try to tell people like when we go to get, try to get the funding, you know, we have like, okay, we need to prepare ourselves. You know, we, you cannot rely on other country and no one believe that you know because they all feel like oh we import the drug and vaccine and it's okay no problem like why we have to invest lots of money for research and we we don't you know like drug discovery and development you know like uh, not many uh drugs that can pass right then it's impossible for us to get the money then with COVID-19 we just like uh change like before this we produce different type of vaccine for like cosmetic products something but after COVID uh came to Thailand we just uh stop producing other products and change to produce all the protein involved with COVID and we can show that uh, with our platform uh it takes like only 10, 10 days and we can produce like new recombinant proteins, you know. Actually, we get the vaccine prototype like very quick, like similar to other uh, big company, but because we don't have the GMP facility uh, in our country, that's why we have to, it, ha it takes time for building that, you know, but, but with COVID, it is the, the thing that can like challenge us and, and it's one opportunity for us to show that, okay, we can do it with our platform. And uh, after we get the good data in animal, then we did crowdfunding. Uh, and uh, now we get like have like enough money for clinical trial phase one, and we will go for clinical trial phase one this um, September. And, and after that, af after uh, phase one, then we get uh, more funding from the government as well. Then, um, if we get good data for phase one and phase two, then uh, we, we, we plan for raise fund for next step of the company. Then I think this is kind of like the COVID kind of like uh, challenge us and, and, and kind of like, I don't want to say that it's good, you know, but it's a good opportunity for, for our company to, to prove. 
yeah yeah i understand and it, it hasn't hold, held you back at all sort of practically so Susanne, we heard about you being held back from your, some of your clinical trials but anything about just the generally running a company during the pandemic um so yeah yeah we we had um we had that but um we're we're quite a small team and we we've just we we moved remote because we're based in the university um we you know they unless we were doing um you know work that needed equipment in the university which we weren't um we we were just immediately remote um and um so we we just uh, learned to work like that really and, and in some ways it's been a lot better we had some um some people working for the company who were remote who would come in like once a week um and now um well now that person um is, is much more of a part of the team because you know we're all remote all the time so we actually you know kind of engage with her on a daily basis a lot more than we were doing before so there have been some benefits but um uh, and uh, you know hopefully a lot of those things will will continue but we will be going back into the office quite soon but yeah um uh, I, I think that's probably the story for a lot of a lot of small companies. Yeah. Is the story the same for you, Andrew? Yeah, it's actually very similar to Susanna's story, with the exception that we will not be going back into the office very soon, in the sense that we have sort of established ourselves, at least as a company, as a remote operation. Uh, we have uh, some uh, staff members who are in different parts of Europe now, and uh, that, that works very well and it's very stable. I mean, I'll be going back into the office because, again, I still am an academic at Queen Mary, and, you know, it's, it's useful to have some of those facilities. Um, even during the lockdown, it was, you know, it was occasionally possible once after the very early lockdown to, you know, to use some lab equipment, you know, in a you know, properly socially distanced manner once, you know, once things opened up enough again to do that. But uh, by and large, we've been mostly working remote. Um, it hasn't been such a problem. And I guess, you know, in some cases, we just tried to make the best of the situation that we could. Like, for example, um, in the end of uh, March last year, when, when everything locked down, uh, the teaching that was ongoing um, in most universities, of course, would had to move online at short notice. And so I had to move some of my lectures to, to video. And kind of one of the things I took the time to do then was actually to take a lot of that lecture material and spin it into a free YouTube course on audio programming that then is more widely available for people and you know can help also you know generate interest in in our products but also you know just kind of fulfills this idea of reaching out to a community of people so um you know it's I, I wouldn't say you know I, I wouldn't say that the pandemic has in any way been a net benefit but that you know it's not been you know we, we've managed to make do weirdly the, the problem I think that we're that we are about to have which we're I think is going to be faced by a lot of people is actually a kind of an after effect of the pandemic seems to be a global shortage of silicon chips like uh you know uh, ic's everywhere are going out of stock and you you know you find that the products that you make you look at every possible variation of the chips that you would use and they're all out of stock for a year or longer or you just don't know when they're going to be back in and this seems to be some very complicated interaction of uh the shutdowns last year some big industries that canceled a lot of orders and subsequently came back in and replace them and then probably just a lot of panic buying and hoarding going on but it makes for a fairly challenging landscape when you're a small company that is attempting to build products on a fairly rapid turnaround you're trying to iterate your uh your designs all the time and you're finding that you're constantly chasing after things that go out of stock you're like trying to click order before this chip disappears and then you know it's uh, yeah so so uh, you know i don't think we're done with the ramifications of the pandemic just yet but uh you know we we take each challenge as it comes yeah, thank you, Andrew. So there, there's some interesting chat going on with people answering each other's questions, which is great. But I'm going to start, try something new, which we haven't tried before on these, which is to invite a member of the audience to ask a question. And I can see that Chandra from Watson Envirotech um, has asked, I, I, I saw Chandra that you had your hand up at one point and you put in the message, can you put a point on this issue? So Chandra, would you like yeah. to answer your question yourself? I, yeah, we've unmuted you, I think. Yeah, uh, just an observation. Because you all are innovators with brilliant brains. Okay, you have great minds to solve a problem. Okay, so it is you who have to decide how you want to go ahead. You may have 100 patents filed, um, a lot of publications happening, your PhD coming up front, but you have to collaborate with an uh, industrialist or a company who has that uh, model of scaling and funding, all those things in places. Collaborate in the very beginning, make a clear pattern or a plan that this is what I want to do in future, maybe down the line, two years down the line, five years down the line, then makes all the things easier. So when you draft the legal document, 
how much is the university going to take a share? Maybe it would be a good idea that uh, say the lab is a well established lab in the uh, university. University can have a share in the sales profit. Okay, maybe two percent, twenty percent. That you three have to sit together in the day one. When the idea is implemented as a seed, it has to be drafted properly on a legal document so that all these complications don't come. I can say the great example here from uh, India. Uh, in fact, uh, IIT, you know, Indian Institute of Technology, spins out almost thousand patents every day. You know how many of them have gone and reached out to the last mile? Hardly one or two. I can count within ten. And I have you know, successfully transferred a lot of uh, uh, university lab level uh, ideas to scaling up. We reached out three hundred thousand households by giving arsenic removal water purifier, fluoride removal water purifier, all were from lab to. The last mail, and wherever I go, the complaint is same. The research there is not uh, uh, given the freedom. His hands are tied. Money is not there. The lab gestation period is very long. He doesn't have money. University cannot fund. So I think the simple solution would be make a tripartite agreement from the beginning with the industry or the manufacturing guy who is going to become your long-term partner. So it's a win-win situation for all the three. The researcher will always feel confident. Okay, I have a partner to back up on manufacturing and scaling up. I have the university which gives me the lab and infrastructure facility. All the three are going to win because the invest money, the manufacturer or the uh, company who invest money will get his share. The researcher has patent and all the rights to hold the thing and uh, share it equally to everybody. He will also get a pie out of it so that he can invest more that money. If he is a philanthropist or maybe a good guy, he can reinvest that money in more research and fine tuning the product. And the university will also can put a clause that the money you bring in, I can fund it more to more researchers. Yeah. I think that would be a win-win situation for everybody. This is my humble submission. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chandra. And that's that's very good advice. You know, in certain situations, isn't it? So, uh, Susanna, Andrew, or Pang, any of you want to make a comment on that, with, which you know relates to going to very large scale production? Do you think that's relevant to any of your businesses that would be, um, you know, partnering with a larger company to start with? Um, I think in our situation, you you wouldn't necessarily have, you know, that partner before you span out your company. Um, so it would make it a bit difficult to commit to, um, you know, to, to that partner um, prior to, um, I mean, especially where we are, right? We, we sort of, um, kind of changed what we were doing and so the partner that we we have now would we would not have been partnering with when we span out and and also at imperial um you know that they, they have sort of have quite um defined ways of spinning out they do now have um two different ways of spinning out when it comes to to um equity shares and stuff like that and you can you can choose your route which which um is is quite good for for mm -hmm. people who want to do it in, in different kinds of ways but um uh, I, I don't. I, I haven't tried talking to them in detail about um, you know bringing in a new um, something that's different from their standard way. But yeah, I appreciate that if you do have a um, a good partner on board, you know, kind of doing it that way. Yeah, yeah. Andrew, any comments on that? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think I think I think it's a good point. I mean, I guess you know we haven't been looking at uh, you know the, those kinds of scales, but uh, I guess you know in some some other projects I have looked at you know potentially collaborating with larger industry partners, and uh, they can a bit act as gatekeepers to certain kinds of markets, and you know to have the right agreement with them is you know is is probably important. I don't know if you if I would ever have been in a situation to have had legal agreements drawn up at the time of founding a company, but certainly later on to attempt to strike a, strike a deal with a bigger company, I think is, uh, um, you know, is, is a common occurrence. I guess the best piece of advice that I could get, which, you know, I've, I've certainly heard from others is that, you know, uh, uh, good legal advice is almost always worth the, uh, the cost, you know, because especially if you are a very small player attempting to enter into an agreement with a much larger player, uh, you just want to make sure that you have thought of everything and that, you know, you, your, you know, your priorities are protected. Yeah. I, agree, I would agree with you on that good legal advice. And I think also if anybody, if any company that you're trying to partner with give you a, an agreement to sign, do not sign it until you've got somebody some, somebody from the legal department in your university to look it over for you. Because yes. quite often, um, you know, th those things happen and then, you know, you, you're lost, aren't you? Um, 
so I'm going to make sure that we're covering all the questions now. So um, I think, well, th there was a question that I was going to ask you all, but it's actually bound up in Andrew's question, Andrew Clark, from a, quite a few minutes ago. So I'd like to each of you to think about what has surprised you about the journey of your spin out and what would you, advice would you give to another another researcher just starting on the um, you know spinning out journey? So perhaps, Susanna, can I come to you first? Um. Yeah, sure. Um, what uh, what what has always been a real pleasant surprise to me has, has been the um, just the the huge number of people who um, uh, will give you free um, advice, um, especially in terms of um, kind of institutions like the Royal Academy of Engineering has been just endlessly supportive of what we've done. Um, and you know ha has this amazing body of, of people who can advise you but also Innovate UK is another one I, I was on an Innovate UK grant quite early on and it was a, a consortium grant so they would get there were kind of like 12 different um, people who were doing different things but under an umbrella and they would get us all together every you know, couple of quarters and we'd all share ideas and, and at these things you, you know kind of you, you do feel like people like honestly uh, you know happy to to help and give you advice and, and not expect anything in return um, and you know from that from innovate they they gave us um some a sort of consultant who um was off offering um just advice around your company and stuff like that and um uh yeah i i, I had, had never anticipated that there would be such a wealth of, of people to offer support it's been really really nice Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out, Susan. I think I've always been amazed by, well, I think most of the people who work for the Royal Academy and, and the fellows associated with the Royal Academy are really keen to give something back. And so, you know, the, the fellows in particular will just give endless advice and mentorship and, you know, and there's, there's various schemes that are, you know, designed for that as well so I think the academy is a really good place for, for an entrepreneur to look for advice and also there's other sources of advice as well as you've said and, and people are keen to support um, people starting out on their journey aren't there and the funding schemes most of the funding schemes that I'm aware of do offer that mentorship or guidance as part of the funding scheme so so that does seem to be really important because nobody can do things on their own can't they mm. can they so and Andrew, same question to you really. Um, so any surprises on your journey? And perhaps, you know, um, where would you look, advise people to look for support and, and what other advice would you give anybody? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, first of all, I largely agree with what uh, what Susanna said about the you know these resources that are that are incredibly useful. Um, you know, we've also had a couple Innovate UK grants that were that were really nice, and you know, have met some great people through that. Um, you know, and and through the the Royal Academy. Um, I guess I would also just give the advice to to look sort of closer to home a little bit. Uh, you know, there there of course there are the the high profile national and international organizations, but you know, you, if if you're in a university, you you probably have a local uh, IP office. Um, there might be some programs there that can help kind of develop your ideas. Um, and then also, you may be part of a community, a research community, or a community of interest, community of practice. Um, and so it's not necessarily that you always need to go for sort of generic business advice. Sometimes I think the best advice comes from people who actually really understand the specific space that you're in. So I would say don't don't discount that really. Um, yeah, I guess that that would probably be my uh, you know my my starting position. I mean, in terms of things that are surprising, I guess. Well, I mean, I think you don't always know exactly what is going to take off or even kind of like what, you know, what direction is gonna ultimately be the most fruitful to explore. I mean, for me, that actually happened before even founding Bella as a company. Uh, I didn't set out to, to make this, you know, this, this uh, platform for people to make instruments and art projects and that kind of thing. I set out to do a very specific research project where I built this very specific instrument with this, you know, kind of obscure goal in mind, which, you know, I still think is very interesting, but it was very, very specific. And I kind of almost sort of uh, accidentally emerged that this became so much more useful for lots of other people. So I think it was probably important to kind of just 
have have my eye on that and think, oh, right, you know, maybe there's an opportunity here. And I think there's lots and lots of stories out there of, you know, entrepreneurs who founded a company to do one thing and that turned out to not work at all. And then they did this other thing and that became this, you know, massive multi, multi-billion dollar international conglomerate or something. And, you know, I, I, I but yeah, so, so I think it's just, you know, stay flexible. Yeah. Okay, that's great advice, Andrew. And how about you, Pang? Anything surprised you and any advice you've got to somebody who wants to emulate your success? Uh, um, actually, uh, what surprised me, like when I look back for, for my journey, I, I, I surprised how much I, I learned last few years after we started the company, you know, it's like, uh, I feel like I, I jump out from the lab and learn new things, like, lots of things that we learn and it's not only the science not only research but it's kind of like management skill you know working with people uh we have big group of people like last year at the beginning of 2020 we have only four people in the company and right now we have like 45 people is you know we have to learn to adjust like this kind of like thing you know which like we never for me i never like deal with this big group, you know, and, and especially we move from only doing research to have like going to clinical trial phase one and dealing with the regulator all of this thing. I feel like, you know, first I thought, okay, finish PhD, you know, it, it takes a long time, but few years of doing spin out, like I feel like I learned much more uh, than my PhD. And, you know, like for, if thinking about the advice, for me, I feel like the advice is like um, your attitude is very important, especially I, I think we have to have like have like can do attitude, you know, you, you have to look for the solution because it's going to be like lots of problem getting in every, like you face every day. But uh, for me, I feel like if we look for the solution, you know, like we will find the, the way then uh, that's what I learned from, from my experience. And I think that's very important um, for, for doing spin out company. It's totally different from a professor or researcher in university. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think that's really good. And I think one thing I have observed about all three of you when I've been doing a, read, a bit, bit of reading around you is that you all absolutely are characterized by having a can-do attitude because you wouldn't have got anything off the ground if you hadn't had a can-do attitude. So, so well done to all of you. Um, now, so I've got a final question for each of you and then it's kind of related to the last question in the chat, which is what do you see of the future of your company and do you have an exit strategy? And I guess I'd expand on that for each of you by saying, you know, what, what is the future of your company? Is there an exit strategy? And also what is your future? What does your future hold? So um, go around again, perhaps go to Susanna, then Andrew, them pang so susanna um yeah um we used to be quite sort of uh fluid on our exit strategy but then we we took on sort of um investment to get to the next stage and when you do that you you know you have to think seriously about how to repay <laughs> um you know your investors so we do now have, have an exit strategy to you know um uh, to sell the company and um you know x number of years um and and after that, um, I, well, I mean, I say company, it could just be this project. Um, and we always say, you know, then, then we'll, we'll just start the next one or we'll overlap them and just start the next one. Because um, on one hand, you think, oh my God, I couldn't, couldn't do this again. Um, but on the other hand, you think, if I only knew all this, then it would have gone so much smoother. So you think, what a waste. You know, what if everyone who ever does this has never done it before? Like, that's insane. So yeah. you, you actually feel like, I, you know, I've got to do, I've got to take all the bits out of this that are transferable and put them into something. I mean, at least you've got to do that because it, it would be a real waste if not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So another another product then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Along, along similar lines. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. And Andrew, what about you? Sure. Well, I mean, uh, for us, I guess, you know, our exit strategy is sort of flexible, um, you know, in the sense that, uh, you know, we don't have uh, an obligation to to investors, for instance. So we I, but I think it's nonetheless really important that what we do, um, we treat it as, a, you know, as a, a proper company that becomes ultimately worth the time and expertise and, uh, you know, just serious in investment of care that's gone in from all these talented people. And, it, you know, it doesn't, you know, essentially just, uh, you know, become, uh, you know, just a kind of something that that strings along. Um, but uh, so, you know, I could imagine selling the company 
in the short to medium term, I could imagine continuing to grow. I could imagine, you know, uh, expanding in new directions. That's we're really quite flexible. I think the thing for me um, personally is. I would really like to have a, a career and a kind of organization where the academic and the entrepreneurial sides are really closely tied together, because I think that what we do as a company already is really closely tied to the idea that there is new research always coming out and that we have a, a route to market for that, that is really uh, kind of uh, finely tuned for our sector and really low barrier to entry. And so if we have a situation wherein the, the kind of profits from the commercial side of things can feed back into new research that might happen partly in the university, might happen partly in an industrial research lab, um, I think that there's a, I think there's potentially something really exciting to be done there to kind of address this problem that I talked about earlier, where you have this gap of getting things out of the lab into, into the real world. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess for me, uh, that's one of the exciting bits about um, having this uh, Royal Academy of Engineering fellowship is that, I, you know, it, it helps over this time to help, uh, you know, to build that kind of uh, joint academic industrial career. So we'll see where it goes. And I think people, well, you know, for many years, people have been um, thinking about this problem and, and it has been a problem and there is a gap, but, you know, there's never been more of a need to fill that gap. And I think people are coming up with innovative solutions to fill that gap. And it is about working in partnership with industry, with funders, with universities and providing the best solution for that particular product. It's probably a different solution for different products, isn't it? And different ideas. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you, Andrew. And Pang, what about you? How, what, have you got an exit strategy for the company or and what, and what does the future hold for you? Yes, uh, actually there's not, there's no like exit plan, like exact plan right now, you know, maybe like if we can IPO our company, then that would be great, you know, like, uh, uh, for the future, actually, I I, I want to I, I saw my uh, my company as have like the sandbox for for students as well. Mm. You know, like I want to build a student to 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 be able to work in the the real world, and I want them to be to have experience in the R and D re, uh, research, in drug discovery and development, and you know, like if they are. Like if they want to go, to go out and build new company, then then if I can, I would like to invest in them. You know, like the thing is, uh, I still want to be professor working in university. I want I still enjoy training the the, the student. That's that's my goal, right? But uh, I still think that like only uh, the company can be have like a the lesson learned for for students. Then and and I want to have like big and the team in the company you know it doesn't have to be in only my company they can split like uh, to be a different company you know like uh that way i feel like it's gonna be good for the country because i think we need to build ecosystem of the whole country and area you know like in southeast asia uh, it's very important that we cannot just go for only one company right then the future the, the future of the company i, I don't know how we're going to success or not, but you know, there are so many uh, uh, products that we want to develop. And if we can have one get to the market and can get some revenue, you know, uh, to be able to develop other product in the pipeline and, and we can build like the ecosystem, the capacity, not only like the 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 industry but the people, you know, like in Thailand is like that, that develop that industry we need people in different expertise and we still lack of that then i still think that people is the like the most important resource that we need to build then yeah and i want my company to be have like the sandbox for these people to learn and 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 who know maybe you know like we have like Unicorn, which is a deep tech company in Thailand, you know, maybe not my company, but my student, then, then that would be awesome. Mm. Thank you, Pang. That's a really beautiful point to, to finish on, because I think it really is important to inspire the next generation, isn't it? Is It is important to provide that platform for students. You know, the, the, the students are the future of any company, not just any country, sorry, not just Thailand. And, and it's really important to tap into their um, innovative ideas, you know, and to, and to allow, allow them to learn from people like yourselves who've already gone through those journeys and probably have, you know, advice and, and learning from your company. So, so thank you.
So I, uh, this, this hour has gone incredibly quickly and I'm afraid it's over. So we're going to have to, there's no more questions. I'm going to have to wrap up now. So I just want to thank you all. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Pang. You've been incredibly honest and incredibly open. And I think you've given a lot of good advice and a lot of, we've you know covered a lot of subjects today. I'm sure people might have wanted us to get into a more detailed um, conversation about IP, but maybe that's for another academy session, I think. So many thanks to everybody for um, your contributions, for listening. Thanks uh, to the panellists. Thanks to all of the uh, Royal Academy for putting on this series and for organising. And thanks to the people behind the scene who, who've made this work. Um, I'm just looking at some questions. There will be a link to the recorded meeting. This will be on the website in a few days time. Um, and I'd just like to say that we'll be holding another Academy Cafe very soon. We hope that you'll all be able to join us. They seem to be a popular time, you know, at the end of the working day to relax and, and listen to people talking about some very interesting subjects. So we'll also be circulating a feedback form. So please, um, I'd like you to fill out the feedback form so we can make these events even better in the future. And I can see lots of thanks coming into the panelists. So great. We've had we've had attention for a whole hour from all the audience, which is which is great. So thank you all very much indeed. And I'd like to wish you a good evening and um, thanks very much and see you again soon. Thank you. <laughs>